Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Understanding Behavior Live Study Hall tonight. I've got a great presentation for you. We are going to be covering generalization today. So we're going over a lot of different factors. We'll hop into that very shortly. Um, just kind of like want to keep you informed on a couple things uh, are happening in the Understanding Behavior Camp that I think are pretty exciting. So the um, newest and coolest thing I think is going on is that we are starting to get student-led study groups going on. So uh, we're starting to get more of these. We've got a small group of student leaders that are taking these on, and they have done a wonderful job. We um, currently have three groups right, uh, right now, so we are going on... Tuesdays at 8 p.m., Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Um, in Eastern Time. The Wednesday session, we are also starting at the top of the task list. We just started this week on that, um, and Crystal is running through the whole task list, starting um, with Section A. Super cool. Um, and then we will have a Sunday group as well. That will be at 2 p.m. Eastern. And then um, that we're not having that this week because of Easter Sunday, but we'll have that the following week. And then next week we'll also be adding in a Monday group and potentially some other groups. So keep um, updated on that. If you'd like to join us in these study groups, I created a new Facebook group. It's called the UB um, Active Studiers Group. You can join that. I put a link to it in the feedback form so if you want to check that out you're more than welcome to uh, request to join and I'll let you in so super cool stuff happening um, these study halls are also really fun like I said we've got a really f uh, great presentation on generalization today I'm not gonna bore you guys with anything else how about we just get right into it uh, I created a Facebook event and we had a lot of people respond going to this. I think we had like 65 or so going to this. So um, the thing is tonight, I'll be giving away one mock exam to one live participant as long as you're here sometime uh, during the session. If we get up to 50 concurrent viewers, then I'll give away a second mock exam to a live attendee. So how does that sound? Good, good, good. All right, so invite your friends, um, let your study groups know that this is happening, and um, hopefully we can give away that second mock exam. Um, one thing that can and help with that too is if you uh, smash the like button on this video, this will help push the video higher in the algorithm, that means we'll get more viewers, and then we can probably give away that mock exam. So invite your friends, hopefully we can get there um, in this presentation, because I'd love to give that away. All right, here we go. So generalization, ba, ba, ba. I love this topic. Here is kind of like our agenda for today. So first we're gonna talk about what is generalization. Then we're gonna talk about uh, stimulus and response generalization. We're actually, we'll do a little quiz on stimulus and response generalization as well. Um, then we'll talk about our methods for teaching generalization. I think one thing that's really um, different about how, how I teach this is that a lot of um, study uh, test prep places will tell you like what the technique is, but don't really hit like the purpose of the techniques. So along with what the technique is, we're also going to talk about like how that uh, or what that technique is used for and why we um, have that. And then we'll have a little quiz on those as well. So it should be super fun. Um, the name of the study group, Jeanette, is the, um, I think it's Understanding Behavior or UB Active Studiers, BCBA exam, some combination of those words. But also if you click the feedback form, there's a link to it at the very bottom. All right, well, here we go. Let's talk about what is generalization. So I actually pulled up the uh, Beowulf and Risley definition. I went into Cooper, and Cooper actually referenced Beowulf and Risley. So I'm like, all right, I'll just bring this source here. Um, so they define it as a behavior change um, may be said to have generality if it proves to be durable over time, uh, if it appears in a wide variety of possible environments, or if it spreads to a wide variety of related behaviors. So what is kind of outlined in this definition is three different things. Let's break down this first part. So if, it if the behavior proves durable over time, what word is that referring to? Let's see that in chat real quick. So behavior remaining durable over time, what, what term is that related to? Oh yeah, Richard is on it. Sweet, Hallie too. Oh, love it, being brave with that first one, Richard. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, Ty, Jeanette's good. 
Yeah, so this first part is maintenance. So maintenance is a continuation of a behavior over time that is plugged into generality um, or generalization. Um, let's look at this next part. So if it appears in a wide variety of possible environments, what's that referring to? Looking at if behavior spreads to a wide variety of possible environments. Okay, people are saying like across settings. What like type of generalization is that? Environments, okay, across settings and people. Yeah, what, what, you guys are on track, but what's like the technical term behind this one? Yeah, you guys are describing it really well in chat. What's the term though? So we had maintenance was our durability of behavior. Elizabeth is as close. External validity, very close. Crystal, our study leader, BCBA on it. She's uh, Allie too, great. So this one is gonna be stimulus generalization. So the same behavior expanding to a wide variety of environments. We'll talk more about that uh, in a bit. And then lastly, um, it, um, if, the, uh, if it spreads to a wide variety of related behaviors. So um, this is going to be our response generalization component. So, um, so th these are really the three components of generalization. So we have maintenance, stimulus generalization, so behavior occurring in a lot of different contexts. And then response generalization is that this causes new related behaviors to emerge with the initial amount of behaviors taught. So we'll break this down. Um, we've got stimulus generalization. So um, here's another way to define it. It's like continuing to perform a master target behavior in another setting or when the setting has been altered or with other people. Uh, I wish I actually changed this definition. I know this is not, one, not my favorite, but essentially it's like the transfer of effects from one stimulus to another stimulus. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit more later, but it's like transfer of effects from one stimulus to another stimulus, and this stimulus is kind of like, gain, like a new stimulus is gaining these properties. Um, and then for response generalization, this is engaging in untrained responses that are functionally equivalent to the original target behavior. So this is kind of like finding a new way to do things. So stimulus generalization is like uh, a new context to do something you already know how to do, Response generalization is more about finding a new way to do something. Let's talk a little bit more about stimulus generalization. Um, so you, you might have uh, seen a similar chart to this. So with stimulus generalization, we have multiple stimuli evoke a new response. One modification that I made to um, like the stereotypical chart like this is that this is going to be a new stimulus now evokes the response. So one way to remember the stimulus and response generalization is like, what is it transferring to? What is it generalizing over to? So we had it occur in, a, in one stimulus condition. Now it's transferring to a new stimulus condition. That's what, um, stimulus generalization. So uh, our simple way to think about it, this is a really great definition to hold on to for stimulus generalization because it's nice and easy and, um, to process. It's learning a new context for a behavior to occur in. So new context is evoking um, this response. Um, or this could also be effects of a stimulus transfers to a new stimulus. So this could also, um, I guess we don't really talk about it as much in like operant settings, but we can have like generalization in that category as well. So we saw with like little Albert, if you're familiar with that exper uh, experiment, like they gave him um, cute little white rats and they were fun to play with for him at first. He was a little toddler. Um, so he wasn't scared of them at all. Um, but then they rang a loud bell that was like really loud and really aversive um, and it caused him to cry. Um, and they did that whenever they presented the white rat. So he was like a condition stimulus. Uh, or eventually, like the white rat became a condition stimulus that immediately elicited the crying from little Albert. 
we would say gen uh, stimulus generalization occurred way because they also like brought out like a Santa with a big white beard and that also made him cry. And it's because of that same context and we saw the transfer of the control from the white rat into a very similar stimulus, I mean to a toddler who's not very trained. Um, um, with the big white Santa beard and that um, stimulus effect transferred over. So that would also be considered stimulus generalization, even though we're talking about um, some, um, some respondent stimuli there instead of just operant. All right, sweet. We are up to 29 concurrent viewers. I hope we reach that 50 mark today. We are 60% uh, of the way there. Again, another way, uh, great way to help us get there is smash that like button. Get this uh, uh, algorithm going for us. Yeah, I know. That little Albert experiment definitely would be considered unethical to today's standards because we basically just, like, made him scared of white furry things um, for just research's sake. Uh, so definitely would not be ethical, but that's kind of, like, the nature of psychology being a very new field overall. Like, a psychology has really only existed for, what, 150 years or so, um, if that. So um, our field has, still has a lot of evolution to go. One other thing that I want to point out for our stimulus generalization, um, so a lot of people just say, like, look at the stimuli or responses, but one thing I want to know is that we're looking at antecedent stimuli, not necessarily consequences here. Um, so different antecedent stimuli or a new antecedent stimulus is now evoking this response. So another um, good thing to hold on to. All right, let's compare this to response generalization, then we'll get into a little quiz, pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so in response generalization, this is when one stimulus evokes a new response in the same functional response class as a previously learned response. So we have one stimulus condition now evokes a new response, where in stimulus generalization, we had a new stimulus condition evoke an already learned response. So already learned stimulus condition evokes a new response in that same functional response class for a response generalization. So think about like what is being like generated in um, each of these. In this one, response generalization, a new response is being generated. Here's our easy way to, um, to remember response generalization. So it's learning a new way to accomplish something. So pretty simple. Um, so again, it's just a new behavior in that same functional response class as a previously learned behavior. All right, so here is um, our trick, um, very simple trick. So like whatever there is more of, so if we have an, uh, more antecedent stimuli or more responses, it will be that kind of generalization. Another way to look at that is uh, whatever is generated, so a new context or a new response, that will also be um, the type of generalization that occurs. So here are our graphics, all clean and neat. If you fill out the feedback form towards the end of the session, um, then you will get copy to, or sorry, you will get uh, sent these graphics too. So hopefully, um, these are pretty, I try to make them look pretty, uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully they're cool. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to our quiz. I've got the like mini versions of the graphics to the side for us to use. Um, so um, all these are either gonna be stimulus or response generalization. If you really want your answer to stick out in chat, you know what to do, provide that rationale, tell me why it's that answer, um, and that will increase the amount um, that you learn or take out from this session. First one, after learning to greet her teacher in the morning with a hello, Sarah began to greet all adults she met with a hello. So what do we have more of or what was generated? New contexts or new responses and what kind of generalization occurred? Let's see that in chat. Let me get my camera out of the way so you can see this better. Right here for now. All right, let's see some of these answers. So Robin saying stimulus generalization because she's saying hello to all people. Okay, I like that. 
It seems like stimulus generalization is the popular option. Natalia, new stimulus, different people, response is the same. Good. Yes, yeah, stimulus generalization. Love that. Wow, some great rationales. I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up on all of these. Hey, Yesenia, good to see you. Yesenia is also former UB student, current BCBA. Awesome, loving these answers. Great, Tina. Great, Juliana. Ooh, 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 ooh. All right, you guys are right on track. This one is going to be stimulus generalization. So now we have different contexts. More adults are evoking the same response saying hello. So new contexts were generated. This is stimulus generalization. Let's check out our second one. Jake was taught to clap his hands when he is happy. Soon he started to stomp his feet as well to express happiness. What do we got? Yeah, really great rationales on the last one. Noha, good to see you here. Elizabeth, that looks great too. Tina T. Oh my God, we're re reuniting old classmates in the understanding behavior stream chat too. That's so cool. <laughs> Love it. All right, people are saying response here. Okay, Robin's got a good rationale. Res um, response generalization, new response, and same functional response class. Okay, okay. Yeah, good, Jeanette. Juliana looks good. Yeah, Eliana, good. Good to see you here. Loving this crew. Good. Yeah, great, Richard. Great, Vivian. Great, Elizabeth. All right, you guys are rock stars here. This one is again, uh, I'm sorry, not again, but this one is response generalization because we see a new response being generated in um, that surface similar function. So to express happiness, either clap hands or stomp feet, both of them are in the same response class. We see all new response generated. Excellent. How about our next one? When Alex learned to tie his shoelaces, he also started to tie different knots on bags without being taught. What do we got here? Wow, you guys are working on that. Uh, we've got 36 people here, but only 13 likes on the video. Uh, I'm telling you, if, if everybody smashes that like button, we're going to get to 50 plus here. and We're going to give away two mock exams. So, uh, I don't know. It's, it's yours to lose. <laughs> All right, let's check out some of the answers here. Okay, so stimulus, the response is still the same of tying. Okay. Yeah, this one's a little tricky. We're a little bit more mixed bag on this one. All right. I, I, I like the tricky ones. I like stumping you guys sometimes. It's fun. <laughs> You know what, now I'm looking at this one a little bit, I think I actually put the answer wrong. Let's go ahead and review this. Uh, I think this one is actually both stimulus and response generalization. So let's go ahead and review that. Um, so th the reason why is that we see new context and new responses being generated. So the tying knots, um, the new context was that he learned to do it with his shoelaces and now he's doing it on his bag. So there was a new context. There was also a new response that was generated because he's trying different knots. So it's a similar but new response. I always like that function of keeping things secure. So this is actually an example of both stimulus and response generalization. Um, yeah, Tina T says not fair. I agree. <laughs> I thought this one was more clear because I didn't even catch it until right now. Uh, but this one is both um, stimulus and response generalization. Sorry, I didn't. I unintentionally made that one super tricky. <laughs> uh, so uh, I apologize for that. But on second look, it is actually both because we saw a new context and a new response generated. 
Yeah, for sure. Eliana's saying this is very BCBA exam of you. Yeah, I try to like replicate the real exam as much as possible. So <laughs> I, th I don't think the rest of them are as tricky. Let's go check the next one. After learning to wave goodbye to his parents, Timmy started to wave goodbye to his toys when going to bed. <laughs> no, I'm just, like, I can't even read this without melting. It's just like the cutest thing ever. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who smashed that like button. We're up to 21. We're getting there. We're getting there. 37 viewers. I think we'll get that 50 mark pretty soon. All right. I'm loving the answers here. Yeah, Juliana, that's great. Good, good, good. Yeah, Richard's right on track. Elizabeth, too. Good, Jeanette. All right, 26 now. You guys are too cool. Too cool. All right, let's check this one out. A lot of people um, got this. This one is stimulus generalization. So um, we saw the same response, the waving. It's occurring in a new context. He's waving goodbye to his toys when he goes to bed. Uh, so um, same behavior, but a new context was generated. So this one is stimulus generalization. Excellent. Um, why don't you uh, check out this next one? So learning to play a melody on the piano, um, Lisa found she could also play the same melody on a keyboard with very little additional instruction. All right, and while y'all are answering this, why don't we go ahead and give away the first mock exam before the rest of the 50 gets here. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pick a number random, one to 250. I uh, want you to take one guess, do not guess twice, one number, um, whoever is closest will get a free mock exam. All right. Yes, I love Holden Guest 69. What a great number. <laughs> All right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Cool. Yeah, a lot of people on, on the right track with the answer. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close it. One person got it right on the nose. Our random number was 150. Congratulations to Sia. Uh, got that number right on the mark here. Um, so send me your email um, or just email me right now if you want, and I will send you your mock exam for the session. Congratulations. Uh, we are really close. We got up to 40 concurrent viewers now. So if we get to that 50 mark, we'll give away another one. All right. Congratulations to Sia. Um, also, great rationales in chat. And wow, we're up to 29 likes. I think that's like a record for any of these streams. So thank you guys so much. Um, but this one is going to be stimulus generalization, though. So the same behavior, playing the same song, but it's on a different keyboard. It kind of transfers right over. So new context was generated for the same response. All right, last one. After being taught to ask for a break by handing a break card to his teacher, Michael started to ask for a break by saying, break please, without the card. What kind of generalization is going on here?
All right, a lot of people saying response generalization. I'm not seeing too many rationales yet. All right, Richard's on it. Richard's been killing it with the rationales. So is Juliana, awesome. Good. Yeah, Tina T's on it. All right, let's go check it out. So this one is response generalization. So we saw a new response emerge. He was handing the break card. Um, now um, he is vocalizing. It's in the same response class. New response genera uh, was generated. So we've got response generalization. Yeah, for sure. I like a surprising amount of people mess these questions up. Uh, I I was just reviewing my mock the mock exam data and like um how much people are erring on each questions. The stimulus response generalization questions, it's like fifty percent or more get them wrong. It's I think it was actually a higher percentage got them wrong than got them right. So super important. I'm glad you're here learning it. <laughs> um, yeah, Richard. Yeah, just took the exam. There's a bunch of questions on there for sure. For sure. All right. Let me fix my screen a little bit. Um, really nice job on that quiz. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we're going to talk about the different types of generalization programming, and then we'll take a quiz on these too. Um, Okay, so um, like I said, with each of these, what we're gonna talk about is just a basic definition. We're gonna talk about um, the purpose, and then we're talking about an example. So we'll start with um, these three, I think are very easily confused uh, with each other. So we'll start with multiple exemplar training. Um, this is expanding the amount of relevant stimuli involved in training. So for example, if you're teaching like what a person is, you might show them examples of children, you might show them examples of women, adult, non-binary people. Um, so lots of different examples that all kind of like meet that uh, concept for human. Um, the purpose of this is to learn new relevant context. So it's like, oh, is that person appropriately labeled as a human? Yep, um, but that's a dog there, that's not a human, so. Uh, so uh, I guess that would be more like teaching negative examples, but again, the discrimination training kind of like goes hand in hand. Here's um, an example. So, so I don't know, for some reason I was like thinking about like mentoring like your 12 year old son, but it's like you can drink a coffee or a Red Bull to help you wake up. So um, like multiple examples of the same, of uh, different behaviors that you can do that have like that same purpose would be one example. Does anybody else want to try an example of multiple exemplar training? So kind of like talk like what you're trying to train and then what the, um, like a couple of those examples are. This is uh, multiple exemplar training is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, so what this is used for is to like help form concept classes. Uh, There's a really uh, cool study I talked about in one of the study um, groups the other day, um, but they taught the concept of um, like different artists paintings uh, to pigeons. So for example, all they did was like a discrimination training of like showing them a bunch of different uh, Picasso or Monet paintings. Then they would reinforce um, whenever, like a key peck whenever uh, one or the other was presented. So for one pigeon, it'd be like, if a Monet painting was there, they would reinforce a key peck. But if it was a Picasso, they would not reinforce the key peck. Um, so this pigeons actually learned to respond perfectly to novel examples, the ones that they never saw before. So it's very interesting that they can kind of like, uh, like form that concept class through this multiple exemplar training about what is a Monet painting or what is a Picasso training um, through experiencing like those different uh, conditions and just doing simple discrimination training. Let's look at some of these answers in chat. So CSA, like writing using markers, pens, or crayons. Yeah, so multiple exemplars of tools you could use to write, that works. What about like something like different ways to do addition, like making tally marks, using a number line, using manipu um, uh, manipulative fingers. Um, I think that'd be like different methods of how to do it, I guess. I guess I'd be like te more like teaching response generalization, uh, where multiple exemplar training is more about like, 
Well, I guess this is more like response generalization too, but I think that does work. But usually we're talking about like varying up the stimuli here. Let's look at some other ones. Juliana, Uber, taxi, and buses are all public transportation you can use um, to go to work. Yeah, that works. Yeah, the color blue, so teaching the blue block, blue car, and the blue sky. Yeah, great example, Tina. So um, different examples of all things in that same stimulus class. Yeah, I think that does work. Yeah, so multiple exemplars, it can be, it could also be for different responses as well. Usually we're talking about it for different stimuli, like varying up, like different, um, like different stimuli where like a label is appropriate. Like for example, like this is a water bottle or like something to drink out of. Um, and then like a soda can would also be like something to drink out of, for example. Cool, yeah, great examples in chat. Love it, love it, love it. Good. All right, let's check this next one. So I'm um, training loosely. This is when we're expanding the amount of irrelevant stimuli involved in training. So multiple exemplar training really like learn like the relevant different features or different ways of how to do something. Um, training loosely is just like varying up some of those like the irrelevant con uh, contextual stimuli. This is um, used to like just get your learner to adjust to small differences, um, especially with individ or, like autistic individuals. Um, sometimes like the, they are really keen on those small differences and they can be disruptive. So this is really used like when that is um, the issue. So uh, here would be an example of how to train loosely. This would be like ordering ice cream, like no matter the gender or clothes of the cashier. So like those things like don't aren't really like related to like the skills you did to use to order ice cream. So we're, um, that's why it makes it uh, training loosely. Cool, cool. Anybody want to try an example for training loosely? Yeah, so um, Cal's saying like different colors of the same hue. I, I think that would be multiple exemplar training since like those are like all relevant stimuli for like green. It's like even like this because like an awkward green here. It's like an olive green, but I still call it green. Um, so we would want to include that in the multiple exemplar training. It would, it would making it a relevant stimulus. Yeah, Richard has like changing items in the environment, so like paintings on the wall for, for sure, like other non-crucial stimuli, love that. Yeah, Eliana, that's interesting. So, uh, had, she had a learner who would only respond correctly when um, her pitch was high uh, and voice was higher. That's really interesting. So kind of like getting them to adjust to like different pitch voice uh, that should be an irrelevant stimulus, but it turned out to be a relevant one. So yeah, that's great. Oh, that's a wonderful example. So kind of just getting them to adjust to different tones. Washing clothes either at the laundromat or at home. That might be relevant since like you need to do different things. Like you need to like prepare quarters and stuff at the laundromat. So that might be more like multiple exemplar training. Opening a window. So yeah, if it's like opening a window related to like a totally different skill, like so whether the window's open or not, that could be part of training loosely. Good. So yeah, it's just like those things that are not crucial um, to the skills of what we're varying up and training loosely. Yeah, Crystal, great set of examples, like hair up, hair down, shouldn't affect behavior, jacket on, jacket off. Like it shouldn't affect like the individual's behavior so much, but sometimes it does. All right, let's check this next one. Um, programming common stimuli, the main word you want to focus on here is common. So this is keeping some stimuli the same between our settings. So that's what the word common means here is that it's like sameness between our settings. So usually we're looking between like a training and a testing setting or a training in a naturalistic setting. Um, the purpose of this is to help make transfer of this skill easier to the newer setting. So like we're keeping some things familiar from the setting that they are already familiar with, which should hopefully make um, the, the new skill in the new setting easier to do. Here would be an example. So like using the same instrument at practice as a live setting. So like if you use like somebody else's guitar, like day of the show, then the one that you practice on, it might feel a little bit awkward. But if you use the same guitar as on stage as you do in practice every day, it's gonna feel really natural. Um, anybody else wanna try programming common stimuli?
So again, uh, programmer common stimuli, keeping something same between the settings to help make that transfer easier. Is it a, a nice um, lucky socks? So like, yeah, have your lucky socks and your practice and training set in testing settings. I definitely have like my favorite underwear for sure. Everybody does, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm the weird one. Why did I do that? <laughs> okay, Anna East, thank you for that. Okay, cool. Everybody's got favorite underwear. Awesome. <laughs> Juliana confirmed. All I needed was the one confirmation. <laughs> Cool, yeah, Noah saying like using the same fork or spoon from home into the clinical setting. So yeah, if you're learning like um, those skills for the first time, that will definitely make it easier. Richard does not have his favorite underwear. <laughs> Who's the weird one? I don't know. Um, teaching how to count money with real money. Okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, I think that works. Um, Elizabeth, we have a client that we are teaching to brush teeth. Her mom brought the same toothbrush for us to teach uh, as the one at home. Yeah, that's a great example. So same toothbrush, make that transfer easier. If it's like an unfamiliar one, like there might be like different like sensory things about it that are weird or might prevent that skill from occurring. Absolutely. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, can an example be when like moving to a new place, place like keeping the same decor? Maybe, like Jeanette, I might like, um, you have to look at that like related to a skill. So with all of these, like, you have to be, it has to be related to a skill in some way. Let's check out another one. Um, see, setting up a table and chairs in the clinic that is similar to home to practice eating. Yeah, it works. So same kind of table um, and equipment to use. Using the same pencil grip home and at school. Yeah, so if you're talking about like the actual like grippy thing on the pencil, yeah, for sure. Awesome. So yeah, again, it's like keeping sameness throughout the context to get those um, those behaviors to still occur. Awesome. Let's go, um, we'll go a little faster on these next ones. Um, so mediation. This is programming the natural environment um, to help maintain learned responses. So this one is more focused on like the maintenance factor of um, these. So um, the purpose, fan out the need for the performance manager. So um, we're gonna like set up the environment so they don't need the performance manager as much. Uh, here's a few different examples that I have here. So hopefully these are helpful. I'm using a to-do list to complete tasks. So again, something in the natural environment helps maintain learned responses. Um, using an alarm clock to wake up. Again, it kind of seems like a weird one, but same thing. In the natural environment, helps maintain their responses, so get up on time. Um, and then also like having parents reinforce or help prompt or mediate um, an, an intervention in some way. Again, something in the natural environment helps maintain learned responses. Uh, yeah, a couple questions here. So question, would practicing with pads on or pads off, would that be programming stimu common stimuli? Um, that, that would be different, so that would be like, multiple exemplar instructions. So if you're like teaching like tackling form with or without pads, um, that's like same form, for example, that would be more like multiple exemplar instruction. Uh, we saw another one, cape and phone app with buzzing sound for generalizing haircutting. Um, maybe. Yeah, that might be, that might be, yeah, that's like attempting to like do programming common stimuli. Yeah, that's not bad. All right. Um, so yeah, mediation again, something in the natural environment helps uh, maintain responses. Uh, next one we have teaching negative examples. This one, pretty straightforward. Uh, so this is like teaching what does not belong to a stimulus class or when not to engage in a response. So this could be either of those things. Um, purpose, fine tune when a response should occur. So this is actually like more about discrimination than generalization. If you think about it, now uh, we're like narrowing which aware con uh, a behavior should occur. Um, this one, grandma will write you out of the will if you swear in front of her. So um, don't swear in front of grandma, but you can swear in front of your friends and it will be all good to go. Um, again, this could also be uh, what not to engage in um, 
or sorry, yeah, this is more like what to engage in, but like when not to, uh, or yeah, what not to engage in. So, uh, or what does not belong to a stimulus class rather. So for example, it's like water won't wake me up, but coffee will wake me up. So if I want to get woken up, then I'll drink the coffee. Indiscriminable contingencies. This um, is when it, you make it unclear when reinforcing or punishing consequences will occur. We'll do this by using intermittent reinforcement schedules. The purpose of this is to maintain behavior with, um, with less need for uh, contingencies. Um, here's one example. So like only occasionally take your kid out for fast food for un independently unloading the dishwasher. So they don't know if it's going to occur um, or not, but that will help maintain uh, unloading the dishwasher even without a continuous reinforcement. I pulled these slides from uh, the Tough Stuff mini course, which I'm hoping to uh, finish recording and get on a self-paced module pretty soon, but I thought these are pretty cool and related. So um, this shows like our indiscriminable contingencies um, in a little demonstration about how this works. Essentially, like if you have a continuous reinforcement schedule where you reinforce every response, then this isn't as great for maintaining behavior because um, what happens is that um, the behavior will drop off really fast. In this diagram, um, here's how to read it. So uh, we have a schedule of reinforcement is active for 10 responses. Then the schedule stops, so we're on extinction. So in this one, we had a fixed ratio of one. What we see is that every response is reinforced. And when the behavior was put on extinction, the organism was um, able to tell that it was on extinction really fast. So they only engaged in a couple responses and then they stopped. So it was easy for them to tell when reinforcement stopped. So the behavior stopped really quickly. Versus if we were to use an intermittent reinforcement schedule, which is a more indiscriminable contingency, here's what we got. So what we see is um, same setup. We have a schedule of reinforcement active for 10 responses, and then it stops. So in this one, we have a variable ratio to schedule. So during this um, schedule being active, we see some responses are still not reinforced. So when the um, schedule was put on extinction, it was more difficult for the organism to tell when the um, schedule was actually put on extinction and they engaged in the behavior longer. So by creating that indiscriminable contingency, it causes the behavior to, to continue for longer, even though it might be contacting extinction or not contacting the consequence. So kind of a cool concept, um, well, uh, the Tough Stuff course, there is a live course that's going on on 427, I believe. Um, and then uh, I'm hoping to get this course modulized out on the store pretty soon. All right, last one before our quiz um, is our general case analysis. This is essentially just like exploring the relevant details that are needed to successfully program for generalization. So thinking about like who will maintain the behavior in the natural environment? Which exemplars should we teach? Which ones are relevant? Or like which ones capture the whole stimulus class? Um, what if negative at teaching examples might be important? So again, you're kind of just running through all of our last ones and like seeing like what info do we need to be successful here? Um, is there rigidity with like minor details that we need to train? So kind of focusing on that train loosely aspect. Um, what might help transfer the skill across settings? So like in that program and common stimuli. And then lastly, like how do we fade out the consequences? So looking at how we might program for indiscriminable contingencies. All right, enough talking for me. Let's get to the fun questions. Um, so unlike the BCBA exam, you've got seven choices for these ones. Makes it even more fun. Um, first one, Natalie's speech therapist works with her across various settings and with different people to ensure she uses her new communication skills widely, also involving family and teachers in the process. I wrote these kind of quickly, so hopefully they're still good. We might have to talk about a few of these that might be like have more than one. But that's why your rationale becomes even more important here, because you might have a good answer 
Um, for one reason, but I need to make sure you're oriented. All right, a lot of people saying D. No, I don't see any rationales yet. Yeah, Noah is also saying um, she also has uh, self management and behavior trap listed for strategies promote to promote generalization. Yeah, those are also um, strategies that can that can be used. I left them out in this one um, because I feel like they're just like a little like different categories. Um, self management techniques. There's a large variety of those, but essentially, like the theme is like using behavior um, that sets other behavior up for success in the future. So things like using checklists and things like that. Um, and then behavior trap. This is when like behavior context, natural reinforcement contingencies that take over. So yeah, those are still important to know. Oh yeah, I can't see. Hey, I'm sorry. Let me fix this. Do, 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 do. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Multiple exemplar training for A. All right, let's go ahead and talk about this one. The main one here is mediation D. Lots of y'all got that, so excellent. Um, this is when we're um, using or like programming the natural environment to you uh, to help promote these skills. So we're getting the family and teachers involved to help promote her communication here. I would have also taken uh, multiple exemplar instruction if with the right rationale. So if you're saying like teaching her to use these skills with a variety of people, I would I would have accepted that too. But uh, mediation is the most clear one here. All right, how about number two? To, um, to encourage Angela to maintain her table manners, her parents provide praise and sometimes um, surprise rewards at unpredictable intervals. Which generalization strategy are we using here and why? I'm telling you that why is where you're really gonna learn and take a lot out of these. Good. Yeah, Ty, I love that. Allie on track, great. Good, good, good. Yeah, Robin, I like where you're going. Noha, great. Jeanette, great. Excellent. A few more seconds here. Who wants it? Okay. Really nice job. This one is going to be um, F, indiscriminable contingencies. Sorry, I have the wrong letter here. This one's actually F, though. Um, indiscriminable contingencies is correct, though. Um, so, yeah, what they did is they moved it to an intermittent reinforcement schedule, made it less predictable for when reinforcement is going to occur um, to maintain that behavior. Let's look at three. A behavior analyst teaches Marcus to identify a chair by presenting various types of chairs. So we have office, kitchen, and recliner, and reinforcing uh, correct identification as a chair. Right, I like it. We're getting a strong crew with rationales on all of these. If that's you, I just know you're killing it. Good, Joe Marlene. That looks great. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, Robin, right on track. Allie, good. Few more seconds. Okay, we've got a multiple exemplar instruction here. So this is teaching multiple examples of what a chair is. All of these can be labeled as a chair and we are good to go. 
Okie doke, next one. I'm um, during reading lessons. Emma is exposed to books with different font sizes, colors, and backgrounds to help her recognize words in various contexts. Yes, Joe Marlene, I'll take that as a win. Hell yeah. <laughs> You guys a little slower on this one, huh? <laughs> tricky, tricky. Let's see it. Who's got those rationales? All right, looks like C. And B are popular options right now. Oh, I like where Tina's going. All right, let's talk about it. This one is gonna be B, training loosely. So again, this is um, bearing up some of like the less relevant um, or less critical features of reading in uh, our examples. So um, yeah, we're bearing up the sizes and colors. The words are still all the same, really like the, the letters and the words are the most relevant things. And so if we were very, um, talking about like the variation of like the stories, then that'd be more like A. Um, but since we're just talking about like the irrelevant context of reading, this is more B, training loosely. Um, yeah, these three, again, are really tricky to um, separate. So um, main things to um, hold on to for each of them, multiple exemplar is changing the relevant stimuli. B um, training loosely is changing the irrelevant stimuli. And programming common stimuli is keeping things same th throughout our different uh, settings. We've got four more for you. Uh, what do we got? Um, Nora learns to identify a cat in books, cartoons, and even in different poses to ensure she can generalize the concept of a cat across various representations. What do we got here? Okay, a lot of people saying C here, appropriate common stimuli. So again, this is like same stimuli throughout different contexts. Are there any rebels in the house? <laughs> Juliana saying rebel, so she's going A. Allie, do you have a rationale? I'm telling you, like uh, this happened in a couple of the study groups recently too. The, the crowd is not always right. 
Let's talk about this one. Our answer here is A, multiple exemplar instruction. Really important. Don't just like do process of elimination like the one that hasn't been done. Use your, um, like use what you know and match it to the concept. So in this one, we are teaching uh, different examples of cats. So um, we're teaching what uh, the cats in books, cats in cartoons, and cats in different poses. So these are all different examples of cats, different contexts of cats um, to teach like what the concept of cat is. So yes, A, multiple exemplar training. Congrats to Juliana and Ali sticking it to the crowd, being the rebel, um, strong with their rationales. That one is a shout out to them. Um, but we got a few more. No, no sweat if you didn't get it right. While preparing for a terrorist treatment plan, Heather asks many questions about the different environments where target behaviors occur, availability of parents, what resources are available at home, and more. What do we got here? Oh, so sad, my coffee's gone. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. It's too late for coffee. But I am going to karaoke tonight, so. If I don't throw out my voice too hard. All right, a lot of people saying G. Okay, Robin's got a rationale, asking questions about the different environments. Okay. Jermarlene is saying Tara's analyzing environmental aspects that may be important to know. Okay, okay. Go to karaoke song. If I'm doing, so I'm going to metal karaoke tonight. But if I'm doing normal people karaoke, I think it's I believe in a thing called Love is my go-to. It used to be Bye Bye Bye. And the good old Mr. Brightside comes out pretty frequently um, because white people love Mr. Brightside. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a really fun song, too. <laughs> yeah, normal people? I don't know. I'm going, uh, like I said, I'm going to metal karaoke tonight. So um, the song I'm singing tonight is Legions of the Serpent by The Faceless. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you guys know it. Uh, uh, it's a pretty dope song, though. All right, let's check this one out. So, yeah, a lot of people on the right track. This one is G, general case analysis. So, again, that's um, really just looking at the information that you need to uh, successfully do our program for generalization here. So she's just asking about information that is going to be important to um, write the treatment plan well. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do like um, understanding behavior karaoke night on stream or something. <laughs> that might be fun. <laughs> All right. Let's take the next one. Uh, while teaching Thomas to differentiate which items should go into the recycling bin, his instructor explicitly points out non-recyclable items as well. All right, lots of people putting some great answers and rationales here. Yeah, Felicia, good. Richard, I like it. Yeah, nice and that good, Juliana. All right. Love it, love it, love it. This one is going to be not A, but it is teaching negative examples. I don't know, I can't get these letter right, letters right on this PowerPoint. That's so funny. Uh, this one is E, though, teaching negative examples. So in this one, teaching what is not um, going to belong in there. C is asking, wouldn't that be discrimination training, too? Absolutely. This is discrimination training. And so I was talking about, like, just, like teaching negative examples. It's more like fine-tuning the response. It's really more about 
uh, discrimination than generalization. Don't even know why it goes on here, but it is a helpful technique. They kind of are in the same realm. All right, last one uh, before we call it for the night. Liam's teacher incorporates items commonly found in most supermarkets when teaching him shopping skills to ensure that he can apply these skills in any store he visits. We are getting towards the end of the presentation. I know some people will be kind of filing out, but before you file out, uh, I do got a quick feedback form that I'd love for you to fill out. Uh, if you do fill it out, I will send um, the stimulus and response generalization graphics your way as well. Um, love to hear like how I can improve these, what um, kind of things you're looking for. There's also a bunch of links um, that you can access there. So there's links to the store. Um, there's links where you can um, buy like this sweet mock exam that's only on sale for like one more week. Um, and there's also links to um, the study group where you can join our um, student-led study groups as well. So check that out. Yeah, sorry, Doreen, the um, study hall is here usually at 7 p.m., so we're just wrapping up. Um, the recording will be available if you want to still watch it. All right, I'm loving this here. Good, good, good. This one is going to be, um, wow, we got the, why can't I get these letters right? <laughs> See here, programming common stimuli. That's so funny. Um, programming common stimuli. So um, keeping something seen throughout all of these settings is really the key feature that we're um, going on here. All right, well, again, thank you everyone for being here and making it to the end of this stream too. I appreciate it. Hopefully this was entertaining enough um, for um, you to come on. Um, and hopefully you learned uh, a few things from today that maybe you haven't, uh, didn't know beforehand. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe Marley would say, All right, am I trading loosely if I'm putting the wrong letters on the right choices? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but I'd, I'd argue the letters are really relevant because if you choose the wrong letter on the exam, then it's also wrong. Uh, anyway, thank you guys so much for being here. Again, I've got that feedback form. Please fill it out. I would love to hear what um, you have to say. Um, the Understanding Behavior Mock is only on sale until um, the end of this week. Oh, oh, I, I might do another week, but um, only till the end of this week for now. Um, so go ahead and purchase it if you haven't already. It's a really awesome mock exam. Great price. Um, also, if you have our, a bunny to share it with, you can buy two copies uh, for only 50 bucks. Super reasonable. Um, and people like the mock exam. It's pretty, like Richard says, pretty good. That's a pretty good review. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you guys so much. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, stay tuned. We've got um, we've got at least three or four study halls or study groups going next week. We'll have study hall on Thursday. Lots of events to tune in. Lots of opportunity to get some high quality studying. Um, so choose understanding behavior. Tell your friends about it. Join the groups. Love you guys. I'll see you at the next one soon. Bye bye bye.